Hello and welcome to the Leathercraft Masterclass and in this video review I'm taking a look at the Summit X1 electric edge creaser from Rocky Mountain Leather Supply aiming to answer the question is it worth it for your leather work? Let's find out. So full disclosure, Rocky Mountain Leather Supply actually sent this free of charge in exchange for a video review. So I didn't actually purchase this, it was sent to me by Rocky Mountain. So just to let you know before we get started. With that said, let's move on to what is an electric edge creaser. So not everybody understands what an electric edge creaser is, what it's for, how it's useful and whether it's even for them. Well first of all, many many years ago edge creasing was done primarily in saddlery, for compressing the leather around the edges or just inside of the edge to reduce the wear associated with saddlery and also to reduce the amount of water that would come in from the edges of the leather, which is where leather is more susceptible to absorbing water. Today, we don't really use it for that reason. Mostly, it is done for decoration and decoration alone. So when you have a piece of leather and you've stitched it in a product, wallet, bag, whatever it may be, creasing the edge adds a line in between the very edge of the leather and your stitching. And this line just frames the piece a little bit better and it's more associated with fine leather goods because it adds an element of finesse and interest to your leather work. But an electric edge creaser is more than just creasing an edge. It can be used with various different tips for various different purposes. For example, if you like to burnish the edges of your leather goods, you can rub beeswax along the edge and use something like a spatula, which is the tip on there right now, to gently heat and melt the wax so that it absorbs into the edges of the leather, making it more durable and also more water resistant. Another tip that we have here is the polishing tip. And this is a large piece of brass, which is used for polishing out creases. So if you have a bag, for example, you've stitched the bag inside out and you want to flip it so the stitches are hidden on the inside, sometimes that process can cause creasing, especially along the edges. So just enough heat can iron out those creases and smooth the leather again. The same is true if you've made a wallet and you've lined it and you've stuck the lining especially to the leather. Sometimes what can happen if you haven't glued it on a bend, you can get creasing what is known as rucking on the inside and these creases can look quite unsightly. Well, with a polishing tip, you can gently heat that and iron it back down again and smooth your leather. Another tip that we have here today is this little tip. And this actually goes on the end of a universal heated tip. And what that does is it opens up the hole in the top of a watch strap where it interfaces with a watch. This is where the spring bar goes. So without this tip, it could be quite difficult to get a spring bar in there. So there's a bit of a niche use. So not everybody's going to need that, of course, unless you're a watch strap maker, then it becomes very handy. So just to illustrate in four different tips that we have here, we have some very different uses. So although these machines are known as electric edge creases, it doesn't necessarily mean it can only crease an edge. Now this electric edge creaser without any tips, so these pieces here without any of these, just the handle and the machine itself is $249. Now another alternative that made this style of machine famous is the Regad electric edge creaser, also known as the Filatus. Now the same setup that we have here without the tips by Regad would cost you about $540 or just under $540. So you can see the cost savings associated with this machine over the Regad. Now Rocky Mountain Leather Supply does sell the Regad unit and it's not a bad unit. I've used it myself when I used to share a studio with another artisan many years ago. I don't have extensive use with it, but what I did appreciate about that machine was the cork handles, which is something that I quite liked. Now these machines come with a standard wooden handle, which I believe is ebony wood, and it's very refined. It has a nice small handle, which means it's more nimble but you will start to feel the heat build up in this machine once you've used it for an extended period of time. Now it never gets to the point where it's uncomfortable, but the Regad does have some other options 
which this machine doesn't. So it really depends on what price point that you're working with and what your budget can afford. Another difference between the Summit X1 and the equivalent Regad unit is the tips that they come with. Although they're actually interchangeable, the tips on this machine are actually welded on, steel welded. So the entire piece from tip to end is one piece of steel. Now with the Regad unit, it is brazed on using brass. So sometimes this can soften on certain tips like the spatula tip, for example. They have been known to pop off with too much heat being used because spatula tips are designed for wax. So if people whack the heat up for use on the edge of say edge paint, then you can see them pop off potentially. It's not going to happen on every time, but the benefit of this over the Regad machine, or especially the tips that come with them, is these tips are welded on with steel so that you know that they're not going to go anywhere. Now there is another option in this machine and that is the Summit X2. Now as the name suggests there are two outputs which means you can have two handles. So you can have one set up for creasing and one set up for edge finishing whether that be waxing the burnished edge or smoothing out edge paint. You can have two going at once. So that unit with two handles is going to set you back at $349.99. Still a very good value. Whether you need two handles or not is something only you can answer. But that is an option for those who have a bit more of a production going on in their workshop. Now the Summit X2 may be a shade under $350. But the equivalent is the Regad M6000 which is $1,155. So you can see there's quite a steep increase in price there. Now I can't say whether the Regad unit is far superior by comparison, but what I can say is it's several times the price, but it's not going to be several times better. But that is definitely a significant price difference. Now most of the tips that you can buy for the Summit X1 and the Summit X2 are $54.99, which is also very good value for money. It's about two times the price, or just slightly over two times the price for the Regad. But both of them actually take an M8 or Machine 8 thread. So you can actually use these tips in the Regad unit. So if you own a Regad unit right now, you can actually buy the tips designed for the Summit X1 and they will work in exactly the same way. Now another option is manually heated creases. So this is definitely going to be the cheapest option. If the Regad unit is up there at the top, this is somewhere in the middle price wise. The cheapest option is going to be a manual creaser. Now this is a spirit lamp, also sold by Rocky Mountain Leather Supplies, it happens. But you can place your manual creases over the top. Now manual creases are very simple, usually a wooden handle, some kind of brass ferrule and a metal head, which is your creasing area. Now once it's heated up to the right temperature, you can then press it into your leather and it creates a line in much the same way. Now, can you do what you can do with this machine or any other machine with a manual creaser? Yes, you can. You can still crease an edge just the same way and it will look virtually identical. The difference is ease of use and experience. When you're using a manual creaser, you have to gauge the heat manually. There's no set temperature which is regulated. So you have to practice heating it up to the right temperature making sure you don't burn it, using a piece of scrap leather to make sure that you're not too hot or too cold, going ahead and creasing it, but knowing as you use the creaser, it's constantly cooling down as the leather is absorbing the heat, which it does. So it does take practice, it does take time, but the benefits are there's no wire sticking out of it, and also it's a lot more maneuverable for that reason. And there are many different companies that produce manual creases, such as Blanchard, for example. Now the downside to manually creasing is it doesn't have separate tip options that you can switch out for different uses. It's not as universal, say, as an electric edge creaser where you can switch tips for a very different purpose. You also have to have experience with it and you have to know when it's cooling down, when to heat it back up, by how much, and it can take years of practice. My personal opinion is it's good to have both. If I have a small watch strap, then I can just quickly crease that with a manual creaser without any problems. But I have experience with using it, but I like the fact that I have something that I don't have to keep heating up on the flame constantly. So if I'm making lots of leather goods or perhaps I'm making something much larger like a bag panel, and I have two panels and a base and a gusset to crease, then it's going to be a bit of a pain with a manual creaser. Manual creasers are good for 
small leather goods specifically, but it is possible, of course, if you just keep dipping it back in the heat to heat it back up. Some people prefer manual, some people prefer electric, but you can't deny the versatility of the electric edge cruiser. Some of the interesting points to note is how quickly an electric edge creaser or the Summit X1 electric edge creaser heats up. Now, for example, a number six on here, if it were on, would heat this tip, which is the spatula, up, and this tip here, which is an edge creaser, to 100 degrees. So about 99 degrees on number six, which has been tested with an infrared temperature sensor. And to go from cold to 99 degrees stable over the next few minutes, it takes this machine exactly six minutes to get there. Lower temperatures are going to be a little bit quicker and higher temperatures are going to be a bit longer. But overall to get to the standard 100 degrees is going to take you about six minutes. Now if you're using a larger chunk of metal like the polishing tip here, obviously that's going to take a little bit longer. And this tip here, which attaches onto that, onto the universal tip is going to be a bit quicker because there's obviously less metal to heat up, less mass. So who is this machine for? Who would buy the Summit X1 or who would I recommend buy the Summit X1? Now, a lot of it depends on what your needs are. Are you an absolute beginner who's looking to learn the basics of leathercraft? Are you more advanced? Do you have a business? Are you looking to scale? It really depends what your needs are. Now, this has really bridged the gap between those who can afford the Regad unit and those who can't afford the Regad unit. This has opened up a whole new world for people who maybe can't afford to buy the best right now, but they want something that does the same thing. So now people who don't have the budget or they're not willing to pay that much for a Regad unit, you can now get the same effect for a lot less money. So before, if people were to ask me, is a Regad unit necessary for them? It really depends if you're selling leather goods and you're making money from it as a business or a side hustle, then yeah, definitely, because it adds an element of finesse to your work. It makes your work look better, in my opinion, and you can sell for higher prices when you have finer work, generally. But if it was someone who's just starting out or they've done leather work for a few months, I would probably say stick with the manual creaser until you have really a need to buy a more expensive electric edge creaser. But now with this in the market, I think it's really bridged that gap. So people who are just starting out, amateurs in the craft, those who aren't necessarily interested in selling their leather goods, but they wanna make leather goods as a hobby for themselves or for friends, then if you're passionate about it, $250 isn't a lot for a hobby or a passion when you compare to scuba diving or souping up cars or anything like that. There's a lot of hobbies out there that are exceedingly expensive and something like this can make a big difference to your hobby, then I would definitely recommend it. If you're a professional, I would still recommend this machine. It is solidly constructed. Everything feels very high quality. Everything has worked as it should. Over the last few weeks, I've had this machine. I've used it on my latest bag project for the Leathercraft Masterclass video courses, and it's worked exceedingly well where I've used it there. So I can't fault the construction. There's nothing on it that feels cheap or it feels like it could have been better quality or they could have used better materials. Everything feels solid and it feels bombproof. So with that said, let's do some testing and see how it performs. So to give you a little demonstration on two things here that are not creasing an edge, I'm going to take a prototype watch strap here that we have from the bottom of the drawer. What I've done previous to this is just gone over the edge with some edge paint and then just lightly sanded it and abraded it. And then once we've done that, I'm going to use this little tool here to then open up the top of the watch strap. Now, as you can see, I've actually edge painted all the way over the hole. So the edge paint dries over the hole because without doing that, it's very difficult to edge paint around that little tiny circle at the top of the watch strap. So this might be a bit of a niche use, but I'll give you an example of how you can use this machine to finish your edges. Now, a bit of a tip when it comes to finishing your edges with paint. A lot of times I see people using so much heat that there's smoke 
coming off the edges of the leather. Okay, a lot of people, especially people new to the craft, using so much heat that there's smoke coming off and this leads to the degradation of the edge paint and then cracking and peeling over time. Now, in my belief, what this stems from is many artisans are correctly heating their edges, but what happens is when you've been using this a lot on edges, you get a buildup of edge paint on the spatula, okay, or whatever tip they're using to smooth the edges. Now, because the edge paint has been on there for so long, after a few seconds or half a minute, it starts to smoke very slightly, okay? Probably not good for your health, but that's how it is. It starts to smoke, and then they film themselves, and there's smoke coming off it, and then people who are new to the craft see that and think, in order to smooth the edges, I need to turn the heat up so much that smoke comes off the edges, okay? That's not why it's smoking, it's just a buildup of edge paint on the spatula. Now the reason it smokes is because of the time that the edge paint on the spatula has been exposed to heat. And that translates to this as well, because I can say to you that this setting number six works for me at the speed that I swipe the spatula across the edge, okay? If I half the speed that I go over the edge with the spatula on this heat setting, I will burn the edge if I double the speed that I go over the edge with it, I will not get the effect that I'm looking for. So when people ask me what heat setting should I use for creasing an edge, for creasing vegetable tan leather, for creasing chrome tan leather, for smoothing edge paint, for melting wax, the biggest variable is you, okay? And the reason being is you have to have a consistent flow or a consistent speed. Then you can start playing with temperatures. So I can say to you, yeah, use number six and then you try it and it burns or you try it and it doesn't have the effect. Well, that's because your speed varies to mine. It's a bit like putting a finger over a flame. If you do it quickly, you don't feel any heat at all. Do it half the speed, it starts to get uncomfortable. Half it again, you've burnt your hand. So heat transfer is very, very important. That being said, let's try and smooth this edge. So I'm gonna take the essentially a wax spatula, but because it's welded on with steel, we can use it at high heat. So this is around 100 degrees now. And what I'm going to do is just go from one end to the other. So you always wanna start at the very beginning of the edge and the very end. You wanna stop or start in the middle or anywhere along. You wanna start at the beginning all the way to the end. Don't stop until you've finished. Even though it goes around a corner, we're actually gonna follow that corner. So starting at one angle, we're gonna then rotate. Nice and smooth, consistent speed the whole time. Watching your fingers. And what you're looking for is any matte spot, so anywhere that looks like it hasn't been smoothed. So if you see a spot here, don't go for that spot there. Start at the back and then slowly go around to the front, okay? And that will give you a nice smooth edge. Okay, so if you can see it there in the light, it's giving a little bit more shine now compared to the other side, which is a more dull matte finish. So this is just sanding. Some people actually like that and you can leave it like that, but with friction, it will actually polish in areas of use. So it doesn't always look that great once you've started using it. Always a good idea to use a bulldog clip as well could use good practice here. Same again, the smoothing, starting at the beginning and going right down to the front. And that gives a nice smooth rounded edge. There's probably about two or three layers on here. And there we go. So that's the edges sorted. So let's take our dummy strap. What I'm going to do now is let the machine cool down, then remove the tip that's on there right now and replace it with the watch strap tip. So now I've allowed the machine to cool down and I've changed over the tips. We've got our watch strap tip on there and that's heated up on a number six as well. 
I'm going to take the watch strap and I'm just where the hole is, I'm just going to puncture that very slightly. Now you wouldn't be able to get a spring bar in there yet, not without trying to tear off the edge paint. You want to kind of melt that into position. Now, because we're going to get a lot more time on here lingering with the edge paint, you actually want a cooler temperature than you would use to go over the surface of your edge paint to get a nice smooth polish. But because this is so thin, by the time the heat transfers to the end, we're not going to be near 100 degrees. Now I fully expect a little bit of smoke on this because we're going to be lingering. And all I'm going to do is push it in about halfway, twist and pull out. So you don't want to pull it straight out, twist and pull out at the same time. And we don't want to go all the way through to the other side because we don't want to push it through. You can see that smoke in there because the edge paint is now on there and it can't come off. Very carefully take a piece of tissue or canvas and then just pull that off. Okay, mind your fingers. And now we have a hole in there. Okay, and it's kind of pushed the edge paint through as well. Same on the other side. Pushing through, twisting and pulling off. And we've got a nice round hole. So now we have a smooth edge and a smooth spring bar hole so we can attach a spring bar and put it on a watch if this wasn't a prototype. So you can now see how versatile these machines can be. Although it's an electric edge creaser, we've done two functions here that have nothing to do with creasing edges. So let's talk a little bit about heat settings and different types of leather. Now there are three main types that you're going to encounter in the majority of your leather work. And that is going to be vegetable tanned leather, retanned or combination tanned, and chrome tanned. So typically, vegetable tanned leather has a firmer hand, a firmer temper, so it's more stiff. Chrome tan is usually a lot softer, and you can feel that with your hand. And retanned is somewhere in between, because it's essentially a combination of vegetable tanning and then a chrome tan finish. And that gives kind of benefits of both water resistance, slightly firmer than chrome tan, but not quite as firm as vegetable tanned. So it's used a lot in shoes and various different things. An example of this will be Berenia calf leather, uh, as this is similar to, or possibly Chrome XL by Halloween. That's another example of retanned leather. Now, in order, they go for most heat sensitive to least heat sensitive. So chrome tan leather has more space between the fibers. It's more airy, so there's more air between it. So it's more heat insulating, okay? So it's more resistant to heat. So I have found personally in my work, number four on the machine is ideal for chrome tan, number three and number two, okay? Now, if you like a darker line on your vegetable tan leather, which looks quite nice sometimes, you can actually use a number three. Right now the heat setting is on number four, which is ideal for chrome tanning, but I'll give you an idea of what that would do to vegetable tan leather. So taking a bit of uh, scrap chrome tan underneath just to uh, protect the surface there. So if I take my vegetable tan leather, and this is just about one millimeter thick, it's actually a very thin piece. And if I start to go over there, at a moderate pace. It looks quite decorative there probably from your angle, but that's now blackened, it's almost charred. So that's too much heat. But for example, if I went quicker and I did it in a shorter period of time, you can see by comparison, I've joined up on the other side there, by comparison you can see slower with the same heat setting is a lot darker than quicker with the same heat setting. Now this is vegetable tan leather, chrome tan leather is a lot less dense. As I mentioned, less heat susceptible, more air between the fibers. So if I go over there, I can go really slow and it's not burning or doing anything. It's just giving us a nice defined polished crease as it should do. Now, just a word of warning, if ever you use vegetable tan leather that has any moisture in it, for example, you've been tooling leather, 
you've been dyeing it, especially water-based dyes, or you've spilled any water on the edges, or you've been slicking the edges with some water and it's damp, do not heat crease an edge on vegetable tan leather. I'll give you an example here. So if I let that water just soak in for a second, simulating a wet piece, the water is gonna fill all the air pockets inside the leather so that when I go over, heat transfer is very, very quick. And we should get a nice burn even though we go over with the same speed. Case in point. So when that dries, it will be nice and charred and you can feel it's all gone raggedy over the edge there. It's all warped and that is now damaged. So anytime you use any water on the edges, be very, very careful using heat because it transfers much faster. So using some of the information that we've learned today, I thought we would have a little bit of a fun project to do at the end of this review. Now earlier you heard me mention that I liked the cork handles on the Regad unit. So the handles that you can purchase with the cork wrapping around them, very, very good heat resistance and very comfortable. Now you can do something very similar with leather. And as you've learned today, one of the best insulators in the leather world is chrome tan leather. There's a lot of air pockets in between the fibers which protects from heat. So what we can do is take a square of leather. So it's almost a square, it's actually a rectangle. It is 85 millimeters wide and 95 millimeters long. Now you can have a cut edge all the way around. What I've actually done is cut a piece 10 millimeters larger either side. So it's actually 115 millimeters and then I've folded over the edge as you can see here. So I've just skived the edges and then fold them over and glued them down. Now, if you're looking to learn how to hand skive or machine skive, or indeed how to turn an edge, there's a course for that in the Leathercraft Masterclass, link in the description below. But that being said, just a rectangle of leather, 85 millimeters by 95, that's all we need. Now I've got ahead and used the machine to crease the edge along here. And what I'm going to do is chase that with a stitching chisel. Okay, not a pricking iron, stitching chisel. We just want a smaller hole. And then we're gonna wrap it around the handle and then we're going to stitch all the way down. Now the great thing about this handle is it's the same circumference all the way up to about there before it starts to taper. So we can have a perfect rectangle with straight sides and it's gonna fit wonderfully. Now I've cut this so that it's very slightly short and then when we stitch it in, it's going to stretch it together very slightly and that's going to create a nice firm handle. So for this, we don't need to use a pricking iron or anything like that because we don't want any wide slits. We want something a little bit smaller. So I'm going to go for a four millimeter, four or five millimeter stitching chisel. Now these are cheap as chips. You can buy them anywhere, uh, but they make a smaller hole. So that's what we're looking for. We don't want anything too loose. So I'm going to start about a millimeter down from the top. And I'm just gonna follow that line all the way down for about two and a half millimeters in. And then I'm gonna switch it over and do exactly the same thing on the other side, starting in exactly the same place, about a millimeter millimeter and a half down from the edge. So there we go. So on both sides now, we've got holes all the way along. So let's take the handle and put it in the clams. So here we are at the clams and I have the handle in the clams nice and steady. Now we have our piece of leather here and on one side you're gonna notice a piece of double-sided adhesive tape. So I've just taken off the top of it. We have a nice sticky surface and it's just inside of where those marks are. So you can see the prongs have gone all the way through and the stick is just behind it. Now you can rotate this any way you like it. There's no orientation to this. I'm just going to place it just behind this little chamfer at the end here, right in the center of the handle. And then just press that adhesive in place. Now I'm going to wrap it round and I'm going to take one needle and place it in the other side. 
and I'm just going to equal that up. And then once you've equalized out, you can just grab an elastic band and then place that on there. Just for the time being, just hold everything steady. We're going to take one needle, doesn't matter which one, take the right one. I'm going to put it in the opposite side. Just pull your threads down out of the way so that you don't pierce the thread. That's going to go through there. And before we cinch that down, we're going to take the opposite needle, in this case my left, and we're going to put this in here. At this point, just double check that your threads are equal up, and they are and then you can cinch it in a little bit tighter. And now what we're gonna do is stitch down. So I'm gonna take my right needle here, go in the opposite. So I'm always gonna start with the right. Doesn't matter which side you start with actually, as long as you keep going the same side. Sometimes it's difficult to find the hole, you just put one needle in there and then just chase it. And then once you've done that side, take the opposite needle and do the same thing on the other side. And then you just keep going until you've gone all the way down. And last stitch, we're going to do a version of what we did at the beginning. Just cross them over. And then place in the needles in the opposite holes. And to finish off, we're just going to snip those threads and then just tuck them back in very slightly. And then what I like to do is get some PVA glue and I'm going to put it over that back stitch as well. So you're actually fusing the fibers together. Just rub it in and then just take a cloth and wipe off any excess. And that really helps to keep everything steady. When you're finished, just going to take flat burnisher and then just press those in now we have it a nice thermally insulating handle to put your hand around and for more reviews don't forget to like subscribe and turn on your notifications Thanks for watching.